The Natural History Museum researchers Professor Kurt Kerr and Annas Björk travelled with aerial photographer Hans Henrik Tolstrup to Greenland to follow in Knud Rasmussen and Lau Koch's footsteps. As a result of this expedition, a numerous amount of aerial shots were taken for this documentary. We had decided to spend four days photographing and flying over the coasts of Greenland. When uh, the early flying pioneers did it, they spent several years. On the first day, after the plane arrived from Iceland in Kulusuk, we flew uh, into the Sermelik Fjord, which is right next to Kulusuk on the southeast coast, because we wanted to take some photos of the Helheim Glacier. And the Helheim Glacier is a really unique glacier. It's super large and moves with very great speeds. And also the photographs that uh, Knud Rasmussen took when he was there in the early 30s were really good. Then we went north towards Kangalusuak Glacier. This is also one of the major glaciers of Greenland. We got some good photos there too. Then we had to go even further north along the Blosseville coast. And the Blosseville coast was really spectacular. The, the place is famous and known for, from sailors from centuries for being a really rugged and rough place. Then we crossed Skorsby Sund. And Skorsby Sund is the largest fjord system in the entire world. After Skorsby Sund we had to put down the plane in uh, Constable Point, which is a big airport. But we spent the night there and were extremely lucky to wake up the next morning for another day of great sunshine. We crossed Jameson Land, which is really a unique place. It's sedimentary rock and the colors are really astonishing. We saw it in the morning where the sunshine was low and the, the rocks looked like they were glowing with yellow and bright red colors. There's not very much ice on Jameson Land, but there is uh, further north when we get to Stowning Alps. And the Stowning Alps were also extremely beautiful. We flew back to Kulusuk to put fuel on the plane. And then we took our little twin otter and flew it across the inland ice. It's a quite a long flight over the inland ice, but there are still things to see. We can see on the, on the surface of the ice meltwater. Not on the top of the ice sheet, but once we get closer to the margin, we will see meltwater streams and meltwater lakes. Then we came to Nuuk and had our, our, our second night there. We flew north towards Sukkertoppen or Sugarloaf, where they also recorded some really beautiful photographs in the early 30s. We were able to get under the clouds and take some beautiful photographs with a very dramatic look. We actually chose one of these photos for the front cover of the, of the book. After Manitok, we went further down south of the west coast and flew to Nasasuak, the big airbase that was built in the southern coast of West Greenland. We stayed there for another day. And when we woke up on the fourth day, our last day of flying, we were just happy to see that the sun was shining once again. We flew then along the southeastern coast all the way up to Nasasuak again. In the summer of 2013, we were a group of scientists from the Natural History Museum of Denmark and also uh, scientists from the University of Aarhus also. We went together to Greenland and with us we had a bunch of uh, very old photographs that were taken from airplanes. And the photographs were recorded in 32 and 33. And they are really special because this was the first time that the uh, photographs from the air had been recorded over Greenland. A little more than 80 years ago in 1932, Denmark began mapping Greenland's coastline. This was due to a dispute with Norway regarding sovereignty over East Greenland. At that time, Eastern Greenland was practically a no man's land. So both Norway and Denmark decided to make really big campaigns, uh, field expeditions to Greenland with big ships, bringing airplanes and mapping from the air. On April the 5th, 1932, the International Court in The Hague decided in Denmark's favour. Norway's action was declared illegal 
and Denmark was awarded full sovereignty over all Greenland. The massive Danish research initiative became the starting point for new modern forms of expedition. This revolutionized the mapping of Greenland and gave Denmark a place at the forefront of international scientific power in the Arctic. Before 1930s, uh, the land has been mapped by explorers like the most famous is Knud Rasmussen, who were uh, taking dog sledges around the coast of Greenland and across the ice sheet and mapping from the dog sledges. Uh, now this was a, a new way of mapping uh, with a lot of airplanes, teams on the ground, uh, more than 100 persons in one expedition, and the expeditions could last for several years. We flew 7,000 kilometers in four days at an altitude of 4,000 meters. They took the photographs to map the land, but also on the photographs are a lot of pictures of glaciers. And these pictures from the 30s are extremely important because they give us an idea of what has happened in the last 80 years. We have a pretty good idea of what's happening right now, and also what has happened the last uh, couple of decades. But before the early 70s, when this, we pretty much have mm, little idea of what has happened with the glaciers. There were many photographs containing glaciers, and as we know, Greenland's glaciers are melting. We need a longer time perspective, and thanks to the photographs, we can go back 80 years in time. This large archive has proven very useful in the study of climate change. When we talk about the glacier science, one of the biggest questions is, uh, can we make a reliable model of how uh, the ice sheets are going to react in the future? And the reason we want to make these models is, of course, that we are interested in seeing how fast is sea level going to rise because it has such a huge impact on everybody living in the world. And once we know more about how the ice sheet is reacting, then we can make better models. The basement at Suez land consists of almost half a billion year old limestone and sandstone and has experienced many glaciations. The glaciers at Suez land are not connected to the Greenland ice sheet and all of them terminate on land. Since 1933 there has been extensive melting largely because the glacial fronts are located at low level. The large glacier in the valley has receded about three kilometers. When uh, warm currents uh, reach the coast of Greenland, and they often do, and there's a warm Atlantic current that heats up uh, northern Europe, and that uh, current goes to Greenland as well. And it goes along the eastern coast of Greenland. And once in a while, they reach into, all the way into the coast and into the fjords. And once this, a warm current uh, hits this glacier front, the, the speed of the glacier can triple or even go faster within a very, very short time. And that causes a lot of ice to be released into the oceans. Antarctica has been stable for many, many years, but right now it's contributing to sea level rise. But sea level also rising from uh, glaciers that are losing ice in uh, South America, in North America, and in Asia. All over the world, the ice is melting due to these rising temperatures. If all ice was to melt from Greenland right now, it would be seven meters of sea level rise. Here is an illustration of the large glacier Jakobshavn Eastbrae in Disco Bay, the fastest moving glacier in the Northern Hemisphere. The glacier loses mass by surface melting and by carving in the deep fjord. Water from the snow and ice that melt on the surface flows via streams to form lakes, while some of it reaches the floor of the glacier. When warm water from the Atlantic enters the fjord, red arrows show the rate of carving increases, resulting in very large loss of mass.
There are few places along the coast of Greenland where the effects of melting are as clear as the Midgård Glacier. Its front has receded about 30 kilometers and an entire fjord has been exposed. Standing at sea level by the new fjord and looking towards the mountains, you can see the trim lines at a height of 6,000 meters. The fjord is four kilometers wide and it is 55 kilometers from the front of the glacier to the point in which the photograph was taken in the summer of 2013. This glacier has been continuously receding since the first photograph was taken in 1933, but the rate of melting has increased through recent decades. last 15-20 uh, years we have experienced a temperature that has been increasing and increasing and increasing and in particular in the Arctic. The whole world has also seen the increasing temperatures in this period but the climate hasn't been stable when we look at the last hundred years. For example in the 20s and in the 30s the temperatures they were increasing. Uh, before then it was uh, the end of the little ice age so the ice sheet was growing the little glaciers were also growing. In the 20s and in the 30s, the temperatures were rising actually uh, more rapid than they are right now. The temperatures now are warmer than they were in the 20s and 30s. But we're really excited about uh, this information that we can get from the glaciers because we can use this as an analog to what is happening right now. Uh, the, the time span that we have measurements of the ice has been a time where temperature has been increasing steadily and also rapidly. But it's interesting to go back in time and see how has the ice reacted to similar changes in the past. There are also examples of glaciers that have been standing in the same position all the 80 years and even a few that has advanced. But when we're looking at the entire coast of Greenland, the vast majority of the glaciers, they are retreating. And we can also see where, with these uh, science projects that we're doing that the retreat from the 30s to the 40s uh, was, was quite strong. The Helheim Glacier is one of the largest in Greenland and the third fastest moving. It has been studied intensely by researchers after it greatly increased its rate of advance in 2003, resulting in a considerable loss of mass. Studies at Helheim have shown that this huge carving glacier is extremely sensitive to the temperature of the seawater. Under normal circumstances, only cold seawater reaches the front of the Helheim glacier. But when warm Atlantic waters enter the fjord, it destabilizes the ice front 
and results in a large loss of mass from the glacier. Gunnar Seidenfaden, Lao Koch's chief of logistics, wrote, The aeroplane, it lifts our artificial eye above the mountain tops. It allows us to see behind the mountain walls. It transports us to the inner part of the country and to the edge of the Greenland ice sheet. Modern mapping has been accomplished as a result of collaboration between the camera, the aeroplane and the stereoplanograph in a highly complicated process. How different this is from the pencil sketches of the previous century, drawn with frozen fingers from cumbersome sextants of theolodites and slowly moving dog sledges. Prior to the 1930s, the hydroplane had been regarded too dangerous to use in the Arctic. But in 1932, using them was considered possible the Heinkel aircraft has three seats in the open cockpit. The pilot sat in front and the radio operator behind. And at the back, where a machine gunner originally would have sat, was the photographer with his equipment. The camera was placed in a movable frame at the base of the fuselage, so that it could be rotated in all directions. The Geodatic Institute carried out this work and the institute became attached to large-scale Greenland expeditions after 1932. Knud Rasmussen's seventh Thule expedition, Lau Koch's three-year expedition and Ina Mikkelsen's East Greenland expedition. And this summer in 2013 we brought the photographs that they had recorded in the early 30s. We, we photographed the uh, more than 30 glaciers from the exact same positions. And with us we also had a photographer, an airplane photographer, Hans Henrik Tolstrup, and he took a lot of really nice photographs. We weren't really surprised at how the glaciers were, were in the present position because we have a lot of information from satellite images. But what I think what surprised all of us is, is when we are up there and we see the changes with our own eyes, it, it, it becomes much more real. And I think this is also what the product of this uh, trip is. It's, it's to give people an idea of, of what has happened in Greenland over the last 80 years. And what we wanted to do was to make a book. A book that uh, tells the difference uh, from these glaciers uh, then and now, what, how the position was in the 30s and how it is in right now, in 2013. And people can see with their own eyes how things are looking. So these pictures, they serve as a really, really important fingerprint on how the glaciers has, have reacted from the early 30s. And they were two big expeditions. One was led by Lauke Koch, the three-year expedition. That one was taking photographs of the northeastern coast of Greenland and the eastern coast. And Knud Rasmussen, he made an expedition to the southeastern coast of Greenland. Then later in 36 and 37, 
uh, the Geodetic Institute of Denmark, they continued these flights and took the southwestern coast. Our idea was to go up to Greenland and fly in the tailwind of these historic flights and take photographs from the exact same locations as, as they did in the early 30s. We were looking at these old photographs and we tried to determine exactly how high were they flying. That we can actually see on the photographs because there's a small altimeter. And uh, where, where the historical uh, expeditions, they used a lot of time. Uh, they were really big expeditions with a lot of persons. They used a lot of time waiting for good weather. We only had the plane for four days. We were hoping, crossing our fingers, that we would have good weather for these four days. And we were extremely lucky. Knud Rasmussen, together with Charles Lindbergh and his wife, who had just landed at Amasilik in his Lockheed Sirius. Charles Lindbergh was on his way from the USA to Europe for Pan American Airways. Lindbergh also visited Laukok further north and was full of admiration for the work being done by Danish airmen in this tough, demanding area. In a single year, the glaciers have significantly retreated due to melting. We have been seeing a lot of headlines in the media. An enormous chunk of ice breaking away from the ice sheet, with all the water flowing from the ocean into the melting glaciers, is making the sea level rise. This process has been accelerating over the past 10 years. Flying in the open aircraft at an altitude up to 4,300 meters and with temperatures down to minus 40 degrees Celsius was something of a trial for the crew. Between 1932 and the outbreak of World War II, a massive 10 to 11,000 photographs were taken. After this, conditions became too hazardous for the expeditions. However, after the war, the expeditions resumed with the participation from, among others, the Americans. Many of the smaller glaciers that terminate on land have disappeared over much of Greenland during the last decades. They advanced during the Little Ice Age and reached a size they simply were not able to maintain. This can clearly be seen with small glaciers where the retreat of a few hundred meters can result in halving their mass this example from southern Greenland shows glaciers that are retreating rapidly. To make a prediction on sea level rise, you have to know uh, how the system works. And we have a lot of good ideas about how the ice works, but there are also a lot of questions that we, we don't know. And that's mainly because we have a short period of observations. So we're always trying to become uh, smarter on how the ice works. And when we become smarter, then the models will be more, re more reliable and the error bar will be smaller. And that's uh, something that this uh, work that we're doing will help people understand how the glaciers are reacting to changes in temperature and in climate. And what we can see now is that in the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, this has really caused uh, an extra amount of ice to be released from the Greenland ice sheet into the oceans. And the difference between these two periods is, uh, uh, with regard to the temperature, is that it's actually warmer now than it was in the 20s and 30s. In the 20s and 30s, uh, most of the glaciers in Greenland retreated, and many of them, for example, the small glaciers and ice caps, they were retreating faster than they are right now. But the big and very important glaciers, those are the glaciers that come from the inland ice sheet or the Greenland ice sheet, and they flow into the ocean. And when they reach the ocean, icebergs break off. We've all seen this in television. Uh, it's really dramatic to see this, but it's very normal for these glaciers. They flow into the ocean. There's always a, a pressure from the inside of the ice sheet, so it's always delivering ice. The ice is flowing like a, like a river, you can say. 
But when it gets warmer, this river speeds up and then more ice is flowing out. People are discussing whether this comes from the pollution from mankind or the extra uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, but for, from a glacier's perspective, it doesn't really matter if, it's, it's, if the, uh, the heating is caused from one thing or the other. When it's warmer, the glaciers are going to melt more, unless there's more snow falling. And right now in Greenland, it seems like there's more snow falling, but the extra amount of snow cannot compensate for the extra amount of melt and release into the oceans. There can be little doubt that the melting of Greenland's ice sheet will have major consequences for all of us. If the entire ice sheet melts, sea levels will rise 7 metres. But even a rise of 25 centimetres, or 1 metre, will greatly influence how we can use our coastlines in the future. This is why it is so important to learn something about the ice sheets, also historically. The decision to re-photograph Greenland from the air was originally motivated by the desire to demonstrate Danish sovereignty over an Arctic region to the international community. A huge collection of aerial photographs resulted from these efforts. This material forms a cornerstone in the technological transformation that revolutionized mapping in the period between the wars. It ensured Danish sovereignty over Greenland and has given us the opportunity to study the effects of climate change on the Greenland ice sheet over the last 80 years. <laughs>